the physical, um, you know, I mean, it, it, some some injuries appeared to be minor up front. Uh, at that time, traumatic brain injury was not something that was talked about much, if at all. Uh, and so, you know, many had visible wounds. Others are now what we know were appeared like, all right, cool, you checked out, but had invisible wounds. Those who were injured in a way that did not allow them to get back to work found it emotionally very difficult to be put on a plane and evacuated out of there, um, feeling guilty that they were leaving their friends behind and um, not thinking about themselves or not feeling bad for themselves, but instead feeling bad for being forced to be in a position to leave. Um, you know, for, for soldiers, it's not, of course, we all have our own political opinions on things, but when it comes right down to it, in a war zone, it's about your friends. It's about your brothers and sisters that you're serving alongside. It's not about the politicians or whatever insanity is going on in Washington. It's about getting up and going out, getting the job done and coming back home together. I mean, I, I had friends of mine who were from Hawaii, who were from American Samoa, very culturally tight knit community who confided in me throughout that you know, year that we were there, some of the very infantry soldiers who were going out on security patrols and and doing raids every day, um, just some of the very traumatic experiences that they went through. No physical injury, but um, creating a kind of emotional stress and trauma that as human beings, they were struggling in dealing with. Um, on a positive note, you know, I, Polynesian culture, especially, but but also Asian culture and other cultures around the world, our guys found that as they were shortly after we got there, the unit that we were replacing, you know, we're taking the guys out on patrol and saying, "Hey, here's this village. Here's where we found friendlies, or here's where we know that there are insurgents operating, and they've got allies and lookouts, and you know, showing them the lay of the land, basically." And what our guys found was that as they were doing these ride-alongs, they call it a left seat, right seat, when you're coming in and taking over, um, that there was there was a bit of a, a tense, even adversarial type of relationship where uh, on, on the military side, there was an assumption of suspicion or lack of trust, uh, just with the local, local Iraqi people who lived around the base that we were at. And without anybody telling them to, culturally, our guys began trying to build relationships. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, for Hawaii and, and Samoa, and we had soldiers from Guam and Saipan, little things like you're riding down in a Humvee, you've got a gunner in the turret with a 50 cal or a machine gun of some sort, little things like pointing the muzzle to the sky as you're riding through a town, rather than pointing it directly at where people are walking down the street, was a huge gesture of an assumption of, hey, let's 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 actually talk and become friends. We had our guys riding down the street and throwing shakas out to the to the local people there, uh, breaking bread, sharing tea, and building those relationships. And and again, I served in a medical unit, and what we saw was uh, a downward shift in. Um, in casualties from the unit that had been there before us simply because of that that basic human connection that our guys sought to make and then gradually finding like hey local you know people who lived in the in the town right next to us were saying hey you guys should really somebody was digging a big hole down this a mile down the road you might want to bypass that or check that out and finding weapons caches and IEDs improvised explosive devices and other things uh, that helped save people's lives. On the cost side of things, how is it possible for a company like Halliburton or others to get away with $40 bananas or however much it was? Yeah. So the overhead costs. Look, what they will claim is that it's expensive to move logistics through a country at war. But they get away with it, ultimately, um, these insane 
this insane war profiteering, and they're not alone, obviously. There are other companies that this is their business model. They get away with it because of their political connections and the lobbyists that they have, the relationships they have with politicians. And ultimately what President Eisenhower warned against with that, with regard to that cozy relationship between Congress and even what he called then the military industrial complex. It's been alive and well. He warned us against it. And I would say it's thriving more now uh, than ever before. How powerful is the military industrial com complex is, as a thing? Is it a, is it a machine that can be slowed down, can be stopped, can be reversed? It can be. It's powerful. I don't think you can overstate the powerful nature of it because it, it extends so deeply within our government. Uh, it, it's not just those in these specific big defense contracting companies that benefit from it. You look at the revolving door within the Pentagon, for example, where you have both high-ranking people who wear military uniforms, as well as those who serve as high-ranking uh, Department of Defense civilians who are literally working their way into a big payout when they leave that job. Uh, we see it with our own Secretary of Defense now. He retired as a general officer, went and served on uh, one of the boards for one of the big defense contractors, and then now back as the Secretary of Defense. We see the same thing in Congress with members of Congress and senior professional staffers in Congress. Same exact revolving door where you have people, whether they're writing contracts for the Department of Defense for the company that then wins the bid for that contract and then going and working for that company, or those in Congress who are writing policies and doing exactly the same thing.